Welcome to the Healthcare Unfiltered Express, where I conduct short video interviews packed with relevant and timely information that you cannot miss. So sit back and enjoy the show. Dr. Rana McKay, we meet again, but this time on the Healthcare Unfiltered Express. It's awesome to be on with you, Chatty. How are you? I'm doing well. And it's kind of funny that we're doing the express as you are like in slow motion on a treadmill or something. So it's like as if like you're running somewhere trying to arrive somewhere. So it's kind of fitting. It's a metaphor. It's an express. It's this yeah. is on the fly. It is you're on the fly. In transit, <laughs> and you're gonna just, you know, listen to this quick podcast. Yeah. Get your get your stuff in, you That's know. Crazy. I love that. So Rana, um, and I know everybody calls you Rana, except I call you Rana. I'm not gonna change. Sorry, it's just you just have to get you, you know, just to get used to it. It's all good. It's all but, good. Uh, but you know, the Healthcare Field Express, I created this thing because it's an opportunity to concisely review a topic or a trial or something that's really happening in the area of expertise of my guest. And uh, we recently taped a podcast with our friend Monty Powell on papillary cell can or kidney cancer. And I thought it will be really important to talk about the most common type of histology of kidney cancer, which is clear cell uh, cancer. So it's really more the question that's posed to you is um, alongside what do we do with early stage disease? What do we do with late stage disease? And maybe what's really happening what should be? What would she keep an? Should keep an eye on? So let's start with early stage disease. What's happening in the world of clear cell lung, uh, kidney cancer? So I think the honestly the biggest change in the landscape has been the introduction of adjuvant immunotherapy for patients that have a intermediate high or high risk localized tumor. Um, you know, there's been decades of studies of work that's been done in the adjuvant setting, testing different kinds of treatments. We had several trials testing cytokines, enrolling, you know, thousands of patients. We had several trials testing TKIs, enrolling thousands of patients, very mixed data with the TKIs. The only drug approval was for sunitinib. It improved DFS by like one year had no benefit with regards to OS and had worsened quality of life and in clinical practice hasn't been utilized. But with Keynote 564, this was a, honestly a pretty simple study that enrolled patients that had um, clear cell RCC, they had T2 grade four or T3 or T4 or N1 disease, or they actually included patients that were M1 resected to NED within a year of their nephrectomy. And they gave patients one year of adjuvant pembrolizumab. The study was positive for its primary endpoint of disease-free survival and was the first study ever positive of, um, of adjuvant therapy in kidney cancer. It improved overall survival as well as improving um, disease-free survival. And now it is a standard of care option that's embedded into the guidelines. Um, so I think that's been the greatest um you know, advancement for localized disease, but there's still a lot of questions to be had because the nature of adjuvant therapy is that, you know, there's going to be a group of people who would have been cured with nephrectomy alone. There's going to be a group of people that are going to relapse irrespective of what you do, but there probably is a subset that you are in fact, not just delaying, but potentially preventing their recurrence and trying to identify who that subset is is I think something that we as a field need to better define because inevitably you're gonna over-treat people with Pembro. You're probably gonna under-treat some people because if you think about metastatic disease, we don't use monotherapy PD-1 in the frontline setting, we use doublets. So trying to figure out and identify the right biomarker is I think um, uh, gonna be something that we as a field need to work on. You know, I think it's the holy grail of any adjuvant therapy, right? I mean, I, I think in any time we give adjuvant therapy in any disease, we know we are over-treating a lot of people to cure fewer. And, I, and if you're able to find that biomarker, that phenotype or whatever it is that allows you to really confidently tell someone you don't need adjuvant therapy, that would be great. Is there anything, I mean... 
Are there other trials happening in the adjuvant settings we should watch for that's trying to yeah. move on Pembro? Yeah, so very good question. So the um, LightSpark 022 study is looking at pembrolizumab with or without belzutifan in the adjuvant setting. That trial has completed accrual um, and we're awaiting the results. Uh, there's also a cooperative group trial that just recently activated called the STRIKE trial being run through the Alliance um, with the PI of Brad McGregor. That trial is enrolling patients, same patient population of, as Keno 564, but randomizing patients to one year of Pembro versus one year of Pembro with six months of Tavazinib, which is a very potent next generation VEGF TKI. So I think there is um, a movement to try to better, right. you know, on this, uh, but I think, you know, other areas for exploration, yes, are the biomarkers. I think the KIM-1 Kim has been the most exciting, very easy biomarker to look at. I think there's also been discussions around, well, what's the utility of neoadjuvant therapy and is neoadjuvant potentially a better paradigm than adjuvant? You know, the neoadjuvant space in RCC has been somewhat untapped. Um, there's been a lot of just like single, single arm, small studies, you know, a couple of sites, but we as a community haven't um, really fully fleshed out what are the key pathologic endpoints, what are the key right. you know, surrogate endpoints. Um, there was actually a large consortium that was put together um, at the KCRS meeting last year to start to delve into some of this, but the field is nowhere near where like breast cancer is with past CR and rectal cancer and some of these other tumors. But I think there's a, there's huge appetite understanding the type of tumor that RCC is that could you be more effective with an in, with intact antigen and intact tumor than in the adjuvant setting. And you won an amazing award at that meeting, didn't you? The kidney. Uh, <laughs> I mean, but you're just uh, very humble to to tell us this, but I will. Oh, good. I'll move to metastatic disease. Uh, and I wanted to separate how would you treat metastatic disease today in folks who had adjuvant therapy versus ones who did not have adjuvant therapy? Yeah, so very good question. And maybe I'll start with the easier of the two of the ones who have not received adjuvant therapy, somebody who is naive of any treatment. So I think in the modern era, IO combinations are the new frontline standard. I think there's a very, very rare situation where you would use a VEGF-TKI monotherapy in somebody who has a contraindication to IO or potentially very select favorable risk patients. But in general, most people are getting IO combinations. I think to simplify the approach, it's either an IO-TKI regimen or an IOIO regimen. And there's only one IOIO regimen. It's nevo IPI based on data from Checkmate 214. And now, you know, these trials enrolled patients, gosh, almost a decade ago, and we have many years of follow-up in the context of uh, these studies. And um, I think the regimens are a little bit different. I grouped the VEGF TKIs kind of together. There, there's more similarities than differences among those regimens, and I grouped the IO IO separately. So with IO VEGF, the response rates are very high, greater than 50%. The primary PD, lo PD rate is very low, less than 10%. Um, the PFS is very robust, a year and more across all these trials to, to upwards to two years with the lembatinib pembrolizumab combination. With IOIO, while the response rate is lower at 40% in the intent to treat population and the primary PD rate is higher, closer to 20% in the intent to treat population, which is really the Achilles heel of that regimen, we now have almost a hundred month follow-up from 214, and we're demonstrating long-term durable benefit in a subset of patients. So the 90-month RPFS rate was at 21%. Right. So with IOIO, um, you probably just crudely, one in five patients are going to have a long durable remission, potentially be cured, and potentially be off therapy. One in five patients, it's not going to respond. They're going to progress right away. We don't have a biomarker. And right. what we actually need is a negative selection biomarker. I need to know who not to give this regimen to. Who's going to be the one in five that's going to just progress right away? So a lot of times we're using our clinical intuition around which regimen to select. What's the pace of the disease? What's the burden of the disease? How symptomatic is somebody? 
And if we think that somebody only has one shot at goal, we're playing the short game. We're like, I got to get through the short game. Otherwise, there's, you know, like, you know, our options are limited. So that's where you lean towards an IOTKI regimen. But if you have the luxury of playing the long game, it's IO, IO every single day, at least in my practice, that's what it is. Very, you know? I love that. That's really, yeah, desperate need for biomarker. How about somebody yeah. who's not in Pembro? So we are in a data-free zone in, in for people who are post-adjuvant. There have been two landmark studies that have looked at IO post IO in the metastatic setting, some of which included patients who had received adjuvant, though not a large number of individuals. The CONTACT-3 trial looked at atezolizumab with cabozantinib versus cabozantinib in a post IO setting. The TNEVO-2 trial looked at uh, tevozinib plus nivolumab versus tevozinib also in the post IO setting. They were basically asking the question of, you know, should we continue IO post IO progression? Because honestly, in clinical practice, right. we all wanted to believe we are we are all drinking the IO Kool Aid and never want to stop the IO. So we're like, keep the IO going. Let me add to it. Like, keep it going. Let's add to it. But these trials were both totally negative. There was no benefit from a DFS response OS standpoint. There was detriment with regards to toxicity. And actually, I think they've helped the field move away from this layering strategy of wanting to keep the IO going. And I think if you think about that, you know, for example, you know, look at tavazinib. It's like, um, you know, the dosing of the tavazinib for uh, Nevo Tivo was a lower dose of Tivo compared to just standard dosing of tavazinib. So you're keeping a drug going for which the patient didn't respond and giving them a lower dose of the drug that is effective that you want to work that they haven't been exposed to it. You know, so there's some, right, 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 right. you know, so from that data, I think there's been a movement away, but we haven't had a pure study that was purely enrolling people post adjuvant progression. There is an IIT called right. the exact trial that's looking at that. Um, but Okay. I, there's more to say on that and, and happy to entertain that if you wish. So it seems like there's there's no wrong answer to that. That's actually very helpful. Um, Rana, before before we end this, this was very short and sweet in terms of knowing adjuvant and then what to look for for metastatic disease. Anything anything that um, that we really are looking for in the next 12 months that is may shake the world of clear cell kidney cancer? Yes. You know, I think we've heard a lot about belzutifan. Belzutifan is a new kit on the block that's approved for late stage disease, post IO, post VEGF. There's a lot of studies that are looking at belzutifan combinations, um, belzutifan or HIF2 alpha combinations. So there's a study called um, the uh, LightSpark 011 study of lymphatinib belzutifan that I think hopefully we should be seeing data on. Um, it's a second line study looking at combo VEGF HIF. Um, there's other HIF2 alpha inhibitors. Castatafan is one of them um, that is also being tested in a large phase three called the PEAK trial. So, um, and there's also triplet therapy being looked at in the frontline setting. So, I think there's a lot happening um, looking at strategies of therapy escalation um, to help overcome resistance. Dr. Ryan McKay, thank you so much for visiting with me on Healthcare Unfiltered Express. Of course, my pleasure. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Healthcare Unfiltered Express. Until next time, take care.